Amen, amen. Good morning. For those of you who can't find me, I'm in the baptistry. It is a a wonderful day today to be gathered together in God's house and to be together as the church because we are the church. And one of the things we celebrate as the family of God is the addition of folks to the family. And so it's a privilege to start our service today with baptism, which is an outward sign of what has already happened in the heart. And so this morning we are blessed to do this as a family together and celebrate with Jessica. Jessica Ortegon has visited with me. She's made a decision to follow Jesus and she's following through today in baptism. So because of that testimony and that belief in your heart, it's my privilege to baptize you, my sister in Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, and raised to walk in a newness of life. Okay? Okay, you can turn and go back. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of starting worship in a way that reminds us of just how important it is to live our life for you daily, to live out loud, as they say. And so today we get to celebrate with Jessica and her making that statement, a public statement, that you are her Savior and Lord. And so today I pray that it would be a special day for her, but Lord, also a special day for our church family and a day that we can remember when we made the decision to follow you. I I pray that that renews in us a desire to live for you passionately daily. Be glorified in us today. And Father, be glorified today in our worship, in our giving of ourselves to you. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray it. Amen. Let's worship together. We stand together and we worship together in thankfulness. As this chorus says this morning, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice.
morning, everyone. And uh, that is a great opening as to why we're here. We are here to praise the Lord. We're here to give Him all the glory. And so it's a pleasure to be here with you all this morning. It's a pleasure to be here at First Corpus. Um, if you have a visitor card, please fill it out for us. If this is your first time here, we're not going to harass you, we promise. We just want to get to know you a little bit better, get a little bit of information from you, and then connect with you, um, give you some information about our church and the different programs and things that we offer where you can get plugged in at. Um, so if you have a visitor card, you can turn it into one of our welcome areas after the service. Now, if you will, we'll go into the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity for us to come into your house and to worship you. It is truly a joy and a privilege to be here to honor you. And Lord, we pray that as we go through today that you will mold us to be one heart and one mind, all with one accord for your glory. Lord, we pray that you be with us as we receive the message as well and we continue to worship you, that we will truly focus on you, that we will fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And all of these things we pray in the name of Jesus who saved us. Amen. Amen.
faithfulness, make us faithful. 
In your generosity, make us generous. We ask your blessing on this offering we bring before you today as we give back a portion of your riches that you have entrusted to us. Let it be used by your church to further your work here on earth and reach those in need. Amen. Stop. 
Amen. 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 Are you glad you're here this morning? Yeah? We never know on a holiday weekend exactly who all is going to be here. Sometimes I just say it could be the staff and the family. Um, And I'm so glad that you're here. What a wonderful day to be together. We start today something a little different. We've been working over the last few weeks thinking about worship and what worship is and that it is really a bowing of ourselves. It's not a service. It's not a time. It is a bowing of ourselves in realization of who God is and who we are in light of Him. And so it's just this natural idea that we give of ourselves because there's nothing else we really can do. We really see God for who He is and what He's done. And so we've talked about worship and the importance of seeing not a service, but a time when we come together and we bow ourselves to Him. And really, that should flow into every day of our lives. It's not just coming to a room and saying, we're going to worship. Our lives should be worship. The way that we live every day should be worship. And so over the last few weeks after that, we've now talked about this idea of change. And and some of you are visiting with us today, and so you may not realize, but just last week, people needed to learn to sit in a new spot. You're in a perfect spot, by the way, Kevin. Perfect. And so so we, we were going... Uh, We had two services, and and we will move back to that at some point. But we combined beginning last weekend, and that was a major change. But I will tell you, there's a different excitement in the room. There's a different energy in the room when we're all in here together and get to see one another and be together as a family. And so what I've been trying to communicate over the last few weeks is this idea of, of coming together in change, being unified in this change. But as I did, I began to think and pray, and and really, I think God spoke to me. And what we've been doing has been important. I believe there's been a desire and a design by God to have me preach on what I've been preaching on over the last, really, month and a half. But as I have done that, and as I have prayed and listened to what God has for us, I've been convicted that it's really easy for us to turn inward. For us to think about us, right? I mean, by nature, we're selfish. Maybe you're not. I am. And I will tell you that that I don't remember ever having to tell our children or teach our children how to say no. They figured that part out on their own. By nature, that's who we are. And so it's so important for us not to always be focused on ourselves, not to always be focused on on our needs and and what's going to make us comfortable. Because really, when you think about it, and what I'll mention later on this morning is God never called us to be comfortable. God never called us to be comfortable. And so what I want us to focus on today and, and really next week as well is this idea that we are part of something much bigger than ourselves. We're part of something much bigger than just this local family. We are part of a movement that began over 2,000 years ago. If we have placed our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if we have placed our lives in His hands and committed ourselves to live for Him, that makes us family. We are His children. We are His kids. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are brothers and sisters in Christ, not with just the people that live in Corpus Christi who come to First Baptist Church. We are brothers and sisters in Christ with anyone around the world who has given their life to Jesus. We are part of a bigger family. So we need not look always at ourselves, but realize that we're part of something much bigger, something with ancient roots, but a very bright future. That's what we're part of. We're part of this family, brothers and sisters in Christ, and it makes us part of a 2,000-year-old movement. And so what I want us to focus on today is really a passage or a couple of passages of Scripture, and and the first one, John chapter 14, we're going to come back to next week because I'll, I'll have a challenge for you 
before we leave here this morning, because I want you to be praying about, you can even think about it now, I want you to be praying about someone that God has in your life right now who doesn't know Him. Because next week, they need to be sitting here next to you. Because next week, we're going to talk about the fact that Jesus is the way and the only way. And so we're going to use that passage this morning to think about this idea of being part of something bigger. And I don't know that you know the history, and I'm going to share some of that with you. But Jesus told his disciples here in John chapter 14 that he is the way. Now, let me give you the context, and many of you know the context. But Jesus was preparing his disciples for what was coming. He was about to go to the cross, and this past three years that they had been walking with him wasn't going to be the same. He would never leave them. He would never forsake them. When he gave us our marching orders, when he gave them their marching orders in Matthew 28, he said, I'll never leave you. I'll be with you until the end of time. But it's going to be different. It's not going to be the same. We're not going to walk. You're not going to get dust on you from walking too closely to me. It's going to be a little different. And so he tells his disciples, he gets them together and he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. This is John chapter 14, verse 1. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. There is a life-changing phrase right there. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me, he says. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. I will come back. And take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And then Thomas, which you've heard me many times before say, we call him what Thomas? Doubting Thomas. I call him Honest Thomas. Because I think he was just the only one that had the guts to ask the question they were already all thinking. He says, wait a minute, Jesus. Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? In one of the most profound verses in Scripture, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And so I want us to focus today on this idea. And as I said, next week, I'm going to come right back to this verse. So be ready. You can even look at each other now and say, he's going to preach on the same verse next week. So go ahead, do it. Get it out of the way. (laughs) We're going to come back to the same verse next week because I believe this is what people need to hear. When Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? When they were there in Caesarea Philippi, and he said, "Some some people say that you're John the Baptist. Some people say you're Moses. Some people say you're a prophet. And then he said, what? Who do you say that I am? That's all that matters. I can stand up here and tell you who Jesus is, but what matters is who do you say Jesus is? And the only way for you to know is found right here. And Jesus tells us, I'm the way. I'm the truth and I am the life. Nobody comes to, to the Father. Nobody makes it to heaven except by me. There are many false prophets. There are many false religions. But nobody comes to the Father except by me. Now, I I mentioned a a quote from C.S. Lewis a few weeks ago, and and I I should have had it in my notes, and I don't. I'm going to do it from memory, so please forgive me if it's not completely accurate. But he made the statement, I believe it was C.S. Lewis, I made me wrong about that, so I'm just going to put it all down there right now. He said, we need not wince at the statement that Jesus is the only way. If we believe that He truly is the one true only Son of the one true living God, it can be no other way. And so if we believe Jesus is who He says He is, then we shouldn't wince or shrug back from this idea that He's the only way. I know in our world today, people call us narrow-minded to say, well, there's other ways to heaven. Not according to this. So next week, we're going to talk about Jesus being the way. But today, I want to give you a little history lesson. 
and help us understand that we're part of this bigger community, this bigger family. The word here for way in the Greek language is translated just exactly as it sounds, way. It means the path, the direction, the way that we need to go to get there. But in Scripture, it takes on a deeper meaning. It really means the way that we should live, the attitudes that we should have, the way that we get to the Father. And and so in Scripture, we see this metaphor that is used time and time again about habits and, and following in this path, following in His footsteps. And so it's interesting... Some would even say that Jesus took this and said, I am the way. He, he really, some would say he, he may have been taking the idea from the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, it says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. So what happened over the course of the first century, just as Jesus rose from the dead, And his disciples became emboldened with the Holy Spirit and began to move out and share the good news of the gospel. As we always want to do, humans wanted to name it. What do we call this new movement? We don't have until about 44 AD, so about 10 or 11 years after Jesus rose and ascended, in Acts chapter 11, we first hear of Christians being called Christians. Up to that point, you know what they were called? The way. The way. I find that interesting. There's such deep meaning in this idea of of being part of the way. Now, we're not the way. Jesus is the way. We're the ones that follow the way and point people in the right direction. And so it's this idea of this, this movement that began... We find it in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. Saul is going to the high priest. He's he's persecuting believers. And he goes to the high priest, and he's looking for a letter that gives him the credentials to go to Damascus. And he says, to find and bring to jail those followers of the way. In Acts chapter 19, we see that about that time, it says in verse 23, about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. So, so it was this idea, this group, this movement called the way. And I find that so powerful for us today to think that we are part of the way. We're part of this movement that points people to the only way to the Father, that points people to Jesus. Or that's what we're to be about. That's what we're supposed to be doing, is pointing people to Jesus. We don't really use that term much anymore. If you've read my blog in the past, there are several times I'll, I'll refer to uh, the Jesus followers as the way, but we don't really use that in, in, you know, we don't say, welcome to the way. We say, welcome home, right? Welcome home. But I, I find it interesting and think that there's value in thinking of ourselves as the way, not the way, but the ones that follow in the way. The ones who point people to the way. We aren't the way. We're just followers of the one who is. It's our calling to point people to the way. It's our mission to guide people along this journey to make disciples. That's what Jesus said. As you're going about your daily life, make disciples. Baptizing them. Immersing them and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey all that I've taught you. Do you hear this understanding that it's our calling to be guiding people along this same journey that we are on? And each of us are on this journey. We're just at different stages along the way. Some of us are much farther along than others. Me being one of those, I feel really old today. I just saw May Lynn walk by a little bit ago, and I thought, oh my goodness, she's an adult now. I have my own grandchild here hearing me preach for the first time. I'm a grandfather. I'm not old enough to be a grandfather. Oh, yes, I am. So I feel old today. But it's, we're all on different parts of this journey. 
but we're to do our part to help people along the way, to point them to the one who is the way. We're part of this 2,000-year-old movement of guiding people to a life that God created us for in the first place. And that is a noble mission. It's the only mission that really counts. We are part of the way, following the one who is the way. Now, how do we walk? How do we do that? Isaiah, as I mentioned a moment ago, in in chapter 40, verse 3, he says, he's talking about John the Baptist coming as the one that would be the forerunner of Jesus, the Messiah. And he says, in the wilderness, the one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. That's what we're to do. How do we do that? How do we live in this journey and point people in the right direction on the same journey? What does it mean to walk in the way? I believe the Christian life is one of compassion. A way, the, the life in, in the way is, is one of love. It should affect the way that we think, the way that we prioritize things, the way that we treat one another. We use words like our Christian walk, right? How's your walk? We need to be walking in the way. We need to be walking with Jesus. It's not a hobby. It's a lifestyle. It takes complete surrender. It requires total trust. It involves action on our part. There are two ways, really, that a person can choose. When you think about it, there's really only two options in life. You can go towards the Father. You can go toward Jesus and follow His way, the way. Or you can go a different direction. When we go towards Jesus, we're going towards a life of peace. A life of fulfillment. We'll talk of that that in just a moment. But when we turn from Him and we go a different direction, we're... We're moving towards misery and death. Those are the only two options. And some of us have lived both of those journeys. It means, as I said, pointing people to Jesus, being countercultural, showing them how to follow Him. And, and it, it's not the popular way, it's not the direction that people choose necessarily if they want a life free of difficulty. It means to literally show them Jesus, the way. Do others see Jesus in you? Do others feel closer to being on the right path, on the right way because they know you? I ask myself that same question quite often. In fact, I've told you this before. I have a little note on my monitor that says, are people closer to Jesus today because they rubbed elbows with me? Are we pointing people? As followers of the way, are we pointing them to the one who is the way? Do others see Jesus in us? In the words that we use? In the way that we treat others? In the things that we stand for? Do others see Jesus in us? We're on this path to live for Jesus. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as those who have entrusted our lives to Him, we are on this path to walk in this ancient but vibrant way. And we're part of something much bigger than ourselves, and we're part of it together. We're part of it together. We're part of this community, this family. And we're on this journey together. But it's bigger than us. It's bigger than First Baptist Church Corpus Christi. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than you. It is an ancient journey that began over 2,000 years ago. We get to be part of it. We get to do our part in it. We follow this path together in community as family. And this life along the way is what God intended for us. It's why we were created. But let me say something, and I may say it twice, So just be prepared. You're either walking in the way 
or there's a very real chance you're standing in the way. Some of you caught that. <laughs> you see, we're part of a bigger something. It's not just First Baptist Church. We're either walking in the way, walking with Jesus, or there's a good chance we're just standing in the way. And my experience, because it's happened to me, is God will go around. God will go around. His movement is bigger than us. Now, I feel very blessed to be part of a church family that isn't standing in the way. But may we never, may we never grow comfortable. May we never stand in the way of what God wants to do in this community, in our state, in our world. But rather, may we be part of it. Always listening to Him. This life along the way for us, it, it, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not a life free of struggle. It's not a life free of pain. As I'm looking around the room, I've walked with many of you through struggle. I've walked with many of you through pain. So we know. When we commit our lives to Jesus, it doesn't mean a life free of struggle. It means a life of presence in the midst of struggle. God's presence. It means a life of peace. And peace, by the biblical standpoint, doesn't mean a life free of difficulty. It just means a life full of His presence in the middle of of this difficulty. It means a life of, of hope. And you've heard my definition of hope. It's not wishful thinking. It is a confident conviction that God is who He says He is. That's hope. Biblical hope. It means a life of joy. Not necessarily happiness. Joy. There's a difference. It means a life of fulfillment. The best life we could ever live. It doesn't mean all that we touch is going to turn to gold. But it does mean that our lives have real purpose and meaning. The way of the Lord is a fulfilled life in Christ. That leads to these things. Peace and truth and hope and joy and salvation. So we need to make sure. That we're following in this path. We're following in the way and not standing in the way. Walking in the way offers the life for which Jesus created you. Walking in the way, walking with Him offers the life, the fulfilled life that you were created for. That Jesus created you for. My challenge for us is really twofold. The first is live a life worthy of the calling by walking in the way each day. We're reminded that we're to live a life worthy of the calling of His child. And I believe we do that by walking in the way to following His teachings, doing what He showed us to do. And my second part to this challenge is, as I said at the beginning, next Sunday we will look at this verse again. Except next Sunday, I'm going to be talking about how Jesus is the way. Jesus is the only way. And the only way to true life, to true happiness, to eternal security is through Him. And Scripture teaches us that we need Him. We can't do this on our own. So I'm going to pause there because I'm about to start preaching next week's sermon. And I want you to come back. Bring someone next Sunday who needs to know that Jesus is the way. That He is the only way to true life. Life that we were created for. Life that sin takes from us and distorts. So again, my challenge is to live a life each day worthy of the calling of walking in this way. And bring someone next week who needs to hear that Jesus is the only way. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are who you say you are, that we can have eternal hope in knowing 
that you are the only way, that you are the one true son of the one and only living God. Remind us today that we have a part to play in this walking in the way, walking in this community, hand in hand with one another, hand in hand with other brothers and sisters in Christ. We have a part to play. It takes action on our part to get up every morning and to strive to live in a way that is honoring to you. So I pray that you would give us the desire to do that, give us the strength to do that, give us the courage to do that. We thank you for calling us to a movement that is so much bigger than ourselves. What a privilege to serve you in this way. This morning now, Father, as we come to a close of this service, I pray that you would continue to work in our hearts. I I pray even now you would put people on our minds that need to be here next week. But begin with us. Begin with us and remind us that we are to be a people living a life in the way and following in the way, but not in the way. Lord, help us to remember the difference. Be glorified. Lord Jesus, be glorified. Amen. Just a moment, I'll have you stand for a time of response. I know I've visited with several over the last few weeks about joining the church. This is the time in the service to do that if you're interested, if you feel called to that. If there's anyone here that has never truly given your life to Jesus, you can wait till next week. I would not advise it, but you can. But this is a wonderful time to come talk to either Chris or Stephen or myself about what that looks like, what that means. Whatever decision you need to make, this is the time in the service to do that. If you just want prayer, we'll be here to pray with you. But respond to Him in this moment as we stand and sing together. seated for just a moment. I want to introduce some people to you. Uh, Robert and Heather Morales, if you'll come. They are literally coming home. The rest of the family's already here. They're near, now here, and so we're really glad. I got to meet with them this past week, and uh, we're glad that you are coming home here. Um, if you will accept them and agree again to lock arms, walk alongside on this journey together, and welcome them into this family, would you say welcome home? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat.
And then Faith? Thank you, thank you. Oh, you're throwing me a curve. Okay, there's another side here. <laughs> Faith has been part of our family for over a year. She came here to go to A&M, and she is from my old stomping grounds. I grew up in West Texas, and we connected really quickly because she's from Floyd Ada, not Floyd Ada, I'm sorry, Fort Davis, Texas. And Florida. We're Florida, either one, yeah. Fort Davis, and I grew up going to children's or youth camp in uh, Alpine, which is just not too far from Fort Davis. Went to Boy Scout camp in Fort Davis. So anyway, Faith is coming to be part of our family. She's coming by watch care because she still wants to stay connected to her church at home, but she's here for the next few years as a student, and she's plugging in here, and she wants everybody to know she wants to be a part of what God is doing here. So if you accept her into this family in that way, would you say welcome home? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. <laughs> what a blessing to be part of what God is doing here today. I'm going to ask Corey to come and make some announcements, and then we'll close. Yeah, just a few quick announcements. Um, first one is there is no Sunday night discipleship tonight. We love you, but please do not come tonight because nobody's going to be here for you, and you're going to have a Bible study by yourself. So no s and tonight, but we will start again next week. The Missions International Dinner is next Tuesday on the 12th. That's going to be at 6 p.m. in Elmore Hall. Um, as of when I just looked earlier, my family and I are the only ones that are attending. So join us. Um, we'd love to have you all there. We've got a great speaker coming to talk about missions. And James will probably be there too. So um, After that is our father-son retreat at Camp Zephyr. If you have sons that are in third to eighth grade, you can sign up for that by using the QR code. It's two nights, you get five meals, and it'll be a really good time for you and your son to connect. And then the Women's Fall Banquet is Thursday, October 5th, 6 p.m. in Elmore. Tickets are $20 each. Dinner and dessert is provided. And then we have a speaker coming in as well, an author, speaker, coach, and plenty of other things. Um, sounds like a really good time for the ladies. We will have sign-ups outside of the nursery on this first level right in front of the elevators. Tickets go on sale starting next week up until the event. Um, we are also in, still in search of greeters, so if you walked in today and nobody greeted you, there's an opportunity for you to help us out on the First Impressions team. So if you will, please contact Jason or Shayla Floyd, and you can, get, um, you can get involved in that ministry as well. And we have Upward Basketball as well. Um, we're looking for coaches and any volunteers as well. Also, feel free to sign up your children for that, and then that'll be another way that we can minister to our community. Thanks. Opportunities coming up. I will not be at the women's retreat, just so that y'all know. Because I'm a man. That's kind of an inside joke, if you don't remember Anna's video a few years ago. Um, I do want to make a plug. I know Corey just mentioned it. But our church has had such a long-standing, vibrant history with missions. And we have this group that has continued to meet monthly. And it's changed names a couple of times through the years. When I was a child, the Women's Missionary Union, if you grew up in the Baptist church, you know what that is. Um, when I came here, it was called Mission Minders. And then it changed to Missions Here and Now. And now we're at the point of Missions Maybe. Um, we need some new blood and new excitement to come in and step into leadership in this group. And so uh, we've been looking at different options of how we keep this going. It's so important to make sure that we have someone in the church that is keeping missions in front of, of what we do. And it's not just going somewhere else. It's going out the doors and being involved in missions as well. And so I do want to encourage you to come. There's no charge to the meal. Tamiko's going to be here with us. She is head of WMU Texas. And so she's going to come down and, and uh, from Dallas and, and speak to us. And so I just want to encourage you, if you have ever thought about being involved in missions in any way, come to dinner, hear what it's about, and let's see where we're going to go with this very important ministry of our church. You're going to sit by your aunt? All right. Well, I'm going to ask... Robert and Heather to come back, and Faith come back, 
And I'm going to give you an opportunity, if you choose to, when you leave in just a moment, to come by and greet them and welcome them into our family. I will be out in the Welcome Center to greet you there if you're interested in coming by and saying hi to me there. So as we are dismissed today, be reminded that God loves you more than you can ever really fully understand. And He created you to walk alongside each other in a way that points others to Him. May we be about that today. Amen. We're dismissed.